will I'll go ahead. Okay. Okay. So good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, participants. Thank you again for being here for our next presentation. So I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. This is Joanne Loney, and I have recently met her. I mean, I've, I've had a chance to engage with her with one of our other career development um, activities, probably about, I don't know, three to four weeks ago. So I'm really getting to know her and I'm understanding a little bit more about this profession. So you remember, we had an imaging presentation on the first day and our speaker there had introduced two of the modalities. Joanne now is also going to talk about imaging, but she has a focus on two different modalities. If, if you notice, she is going to be talking about X-ray and ultrasound. So Joanne, uh, as far as her title is concerned, she is one of the managers here at, at North Stafford Medical Imaging. Um, so I would like to turn it over to her and I am interested in learning more about imaging. I'm sure you all will as well. If you have questions, put them in the chat. We're, we're gonna be reading those questions for Joanne, you know, cause it's sort of hard to see the chat when you're presenting. And then of course, um, if you have additional questions we'll address those towards the end of the presentation. So Joanne, you're welcome to take it over. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, can you guys still see my screen? Cause I don't have that little ring yep. around it. You good? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I am here to uh, talk to you about um, medical imaging, particularly x-ray and ultrasound. Um, so my presentation um, is about both of these modalities. My background is ultrasound. Um, I did not take an x-ray pathway, um, which is one of the things that I regret in my career now is I wish I had that x-ray background before I went into ultrasound. Um, but there's a, a couple different ways that you can get into these modalities as we'll discuss when I get into the presentation. Um, so I am the manager up at Medical Imaging in North Stafford. I um, started at the Imaging Center for Women in Fredericksburg as an ultrasound technologist, moved to the area from Pennsylvania to take a technologist position, um, was there for about 18 months, and then um, applied for a supervisor position. And I was a supervisor um, over ultrasound at the Imaging Center for Women for six years. And then in April of last year, um, this position up here as manager became open. So I took a shot and applied for this position. And this is where I have been for the last uh, 14 months now. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. So I'll get into the presentation. Um, so as Darlene had mentioned, uh, there was a previous presentation in imaging. Um, I believe they covered mammography and CT. Um, there are several types of imaging available out in uh, the world of radiology. There's x-ray, fluoroscopy, mammography, MRI, CT, ultrasound, nuclear medicine, radiation therapy. Um, so many different avenues to take for radiology, so many different specialties. Um, and within each of the, the imaging options, you know, there's, there's breakdowns and, and additional specialties that can be, um, that could be had. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about X-ray. Um, so the basics, what is X-ray? Um, you know, a lot of people may have had an X-ray, whether it's for a chest X-ray, if you've had a cough or you broke a bone or an injury or anything like that, it's usually the um, most common exam to evaluate um, bony structures. Um, X-rays are a type of electromagnetic radiation. Um, it's on the same spectrum as visible light, uh, but you cannot see X-rays when they're being shot. Um, once a patient's positioned and the appropriate radiation dose and technique is chosen, uh, the x-ray beam is aimed through the area of interest, um, so whether it be an arm or an abdomen, chest, um, it's aimed through the area of interest towards the detector on the opposite side of the patient. Um, the x-ray beams are then absorbed in various different amounts depending on the type of structure that it's passing through. Uh, the result is then an x-ray image of the structures between the x-ray beam and the detector on the opposite side of the patient. Um, there's several safety protocols that are in place um, to reduce the amount of radiation administered to the patient as well as to the technologist. Um, some of these protocols are shielding the patient in sensitive areas um, if it's not the area of interest, so like the gonads or the thyroid, um, especially in pediatric patients, you want to make sure you're shielding um, 
you know, sensitive areas that are still developing um, so that they're not impacted by any potential radiation exposure. We follow a LARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in detail in future slides. And then technologists wear radiation badges. So the radiation badges that they wear um, get sent into a monitoring company quarterly. And um, each technologist is assigned a specific badge, badge number. Um, and they monitor the amount of any radiation that the technologist um, receives to make sure that they're not exceeding a lifetime dose um, and that they're staying you know, safe with their radiation exposure. Um, so how to become an x-ray technologist. So there's some required education. So you can do a two-year specialized program at a college or university. You wanna make sure that they're accredited. Um, and you can do specifically for radiology, um, or you can complete a radiology certificate program after obtaining an associate's degree. So if you go that pathway, you would get an associate's degree um, in allied health or any other type of science, and then you would um, apply for, uh, you know, the radiology program, which would be a shorter amount of time, and, and would, you would focus just on radiology. Um, after you complete your education, um, there are some required certifications. So uh, many states uh, require a state license in order to shoot or perform x-rays. Um, for example, Virginia, um, you need a Virginia state license um, to perform x-rays on an outpatient basis, uh, but in the hospital setting, you do not need a state license. However, in Maryland, um, you do need a state license, whether you're outpatient or inpatient. So it does vary state to state. Um, they do not cross states. So um, if you have a Virginia state license and you're moving to Maryland, you need to apply for a Maryland state license. Um, and then also certification from a professional organization like the American Re Registry of Radiologic Technologists. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so X-ray, um, so the ARRT um, is the abbreviation for the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists. It's a professional organization um, that offers certifications, including and beyond radiologic or radiology technologists, which the abbreviation, you know, you get into alphabet soup, it's RTR. Um, for any of the secondary certifications over to the right of the screen, you would need first a primary certification such as radiography, so RTR um, or MRI, um, radiation therapy or nuclear medicine. So you would sit for that certification um, exam first. You would then be certified or registered, say, in MRI. And then you could um, go on to take additional certification exams in, say, mammography or CT or sonography. Um, so you do need a primary certification. So, you know, your, your career path doesn't just start at getting the education, you do need to have these, um, the license, and then also the specialty registry exams as well. Um, so job responsibilities of an x-ray technologist, um, first and foremost, you provide compassionate care to patients. Um, you have to have compassion, you have to want to help people, um, take care of people, they don't want to be sick. Um, nobody wants to be sick, nobody wants to come in and have to have exams done, figure out what's going on, you know, they're nervous, anxious, they don't know what the problem is. Um, so you really have to uh, be able to provide that compassionate care to patients. Um, you need to make sure that you verify patient identifiers, you want to make sure you have the correct patient and you're doing the correct exam. Um, there's nothing worse feeling than realizing you have just done an x-ray on the wrong patient. Um, so we have uh, protocols in place, you know, verify name, date of birth, address, making sure that we're verifying the doctor, the exam that their doctor ordered, um, and making sure it matches up with their symptoms. Um, you obtain a detailed history prior to performing the exam. So why is the exam being done? How long has the patient had symptoms? Is this a follow-up? Um, not only does providing that history help the radiologist as they review the images, but on the back end, it ensures proper um, information for billing and coding for insurance. Um, you don't want to do a chest x-ray if they're having leg pain. Um, so, you know, you need to make sure, and that goes up to the second bullet, that you're verifying the correct patient, correct exam matches the diagnosis for the exam. You follow a LARA. Um, as I mentioned previously, it uh, stands for as low as reasonably achievable. 
Um, and what that means is you are um, providing the lowest dose of radiation possible to obtain a diagnostic image. You do not want to um, expose the patient to more radiation than is needed uh, in order to get a good diagnostic image. Um, so you wanna make sure that your technique is set and the radiation level is low enough um, that you know, it's within a certain uh, level of radiation, but you're still getting a good picture. You don't want it to be too low that you have to repeat the exam because your image didn't come out, um, you know, di of diagnostic quality. Uh, you wanna ensure patient, um, the patient is properly positioned. Um, for the exam, you're following the exam protocol, meaning you're taking the um, certain number of images uh, that is required to complete an X-ray study. Um, usually uh, there's an AP or anterior posterior, meaning you're shooting the image from front to back. Um, there's a lateral, meaning you're shooting it from side to side. Um, and then there might be an oblique where, you know, if you have a hand, it's on an oblique axis. So you're getting the view this way instead of a lateral or uh, an AP. Um, and then you want to um, make sure you're taking care of all of that and doing all of that so that you provide diagnostic quality images for interpretation for the radiologist. Uh, you complete any paperwork and documentation, and then you um, present the radiology, you present your images and your paperwork for radiologist interpretation in whichever electronic medical record that you're, you know, the, the facility uses. Um, most importantly, um, as an x-ray technologist, you do not diagnose or interpret the images. Um, you, it is not in your scope as an x-ray technologist or any, any medical imaging technologist or radiology technologist to diagnose or interpret. Of course, you um, want to make sure that your image is acceptable um, and of good quality. Um, you may see a broken bone on the image, but it is not your job um, to diagnose or interpret the images and provide that information to the patient. Um, you, there's several ways to get around when a patient asks, well, what do you see? I know you know what you're looking at, um, but you just cannot provide that information. It, it is not in your scope of practice. Um, moving on to work environment. Um, there's several uh, opportunities and work environments um, at, that you could work in as an x-ray technologist. So you could work in a hospital and that might be in an emergency department, an operating room during procedures. Um, you might go on portable x-rays to patients who are admitted and can't be brought down to radiology. So you bring the x-ray equipment to the patient. Um, there's outpatient imaging centers like the one that I work at. Um, there are provider offices such as chiropractors or orthopedics. Um, urgent care facilities uh, like Patient First, Next Care, Better Med, any, a lot of those urgent care facilities have x-ray um, in-house and need x-ray technologists to do those exams. And then there's also mobile imaging companies. Um, so basically you have a, a mode of transportation like a van um, and the equipment is mobile enough that you can bring it to, um, you know, wherever the patient is, if they cannot leave their, uh, their home or their facility that they're at. Um, when you're an x-ray tech, you should expect to be moving frequently, pushing or lifting, whether it's a stretcher, a wheelchair, helping a patient stand up, helping a patient lie down. Um, and you can expect to be on your feet for long periods of the, t of the day throughout the day. So in the clinical setting, um, X-ray is assessed or is used to assess for bony abnormalities or injuries, um, such as breaks, bone masses, arthritis, um, basically any abnormality of the skeleton or the bones. Um, it's also commonly used for diagnosing lung or chest abnormalities, such as pneumonia or fluid around the lungs. Um, most commonly chest X-rays, um, you know, many people have chest X-rays if they've got a cough or sick, especially with COVID. Um, and then it is used in a limited capacity for soft tissue structures for foreign body. Um, so, you know, whether there might be um, an injury that happened where I don't know, a piece of metal or something like that ended up in the soft tissue of the skin, they can do an x-ray to see if it is deep enough to be in the bone or exactly where it is so that it can guide removing it if it needs to be taken out. Um, X-ray is not useful for assessing ligaments, tendons, or muscles, any kind of MSK um, structure, um, because it is, uh, 
it just, it doesn't image those structures well with, with the use of x-ray. MRI is usually the choice, um, exam choice to assess MSK or musculoskeletal structures. Uh, x-ray is also used for the guidance of fluoroscopy imaging. Um, fluoroscopy is a type of x-ray imaging. Um, it uses a fluorescent screen and x-rays and uh, a series of images in motion are captured, um, usually by adding a type of contrast agent. So for example, um, during a fluoroscopy exam of the uh, esophagus, um, they will watch contrast being swallowed and going down into the esophagus, kind of like a motion picture. Um, and that will assess for any abnormalities or swallowing malfunctions um, of the esophagus. Another example is to assess for um, abnormalities of the uterus or the fallopian tubes um, in cases of infertility, for example, um, and contrast would be um, instilled into the uterus and then they watch for the contrast to travel up through the uterus and through the fallopian tubes and spill out into the um, pelvic cavity. Um, so those are types of fluoroscopy uh, exams. These are some x-ray images. Um, so from left to right, you've got a chest x-ray, um, and that is uh, usually shot um, posterior to anterior, so back to front. Um, you have an x-ray of the foot, um, an x-ray of the forearm. So this is one of those obvious um, x-rays where you can clearly see that there is a break in, in the bone. Um, and then an x-ray of the hand. So you can see really how the bony structures really show up um, well on x-ray, whereas, you know, the skin and the soft tissue and the muscles don't really, they're more of like a hazy shadow versus the brightness of the bone. Um, and then these are examples of fluoroscopy. So this is what I was talking about um, uh, for an HSD or HSG or a, a hysterosalpingogram, which checks um, for the uterus and then the fallopian tube. The contrast is that white. Um, and so the x-ray is obtained while that contrast is being instilled and they can watch um, as it's moving through the structures. And then the image to the right is of a, a sw barium swallow. So barium is a type of contrast. Um, and the patient would swallow this contrast and they would take a series of fluoroscopy images to watch the contrast go down the esophagus to look for any um, issues or abnormalities. All right, so now we're gonna move on to ultrasound, um, which is my specialty, my background, um, my comfort zone. Um, I love ultrasound, I'm very passionate about it. Um, I uh, am over the ultrasound cross-training program within our uh, organization within Medical Imaging Fredericksburg. So it's a, a really good opportunity for me as a manager where I'm not necessarily involved in the patient care as directly anymore because I'm not performing the exams, but it does allow me to still have a hand in ultrasound, which is my passion. Uh, so what is ultrasound? So ultrasound uses um, high frequency sound waves um, and it produces images of structures within the body. Um, so although it is sound, it's above the frequency that a human uh, ear can detect. Um, so I have a graph down on the bottom left of the um, sound frequencies and um, audible frequencies are usually between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Um, ultrasound is above that. So it is at a much higher frequency um, than can be heard. Um, ultrasound is also called sonography. It's the same thing, um, interchangeable words, sonography, ultrasound, uh, they're, they're the same exact thing. Um, unlike x-ray though, ultrasound does not produce radiation um, because it uses sound waves and it's, it does not use radiation. Um, it is considered a more safer type of exam um, for patients because we don't have the radiation exposure. So sound waves are emitted using an ultrasound transducer or a lot of um, people will call it a wand or a camera. Um, so we use that transducer over the area of interest. The sound waves reflect off of, they go into the body, reflect off the organs and structures and then reduce or return to the transducer. Um, so in this image to the left, you have the transducer, um, the sound waves coming down, bouncing back off of the, um, the organ and returning back to the transducer. The ultrasound machine will assign a shade of gray to the returning sound wave depending on its return speed. Uh, and the result is an ultrasound image. So different structures will return um, the sound waves at different speeds, um, depending on if it's a, a harder structure um, or a softer structure. And that is how uh, the ultrasound image is created by the computer on the machine. So how to become an ultrasound technologist. Um, 
There's several options uh, for education. So you can complete a two-year allied health program um, plus 12 years of clinical ultrasound experience. You can complete a bachelor's degree program um, plus 12 months of clinical experience. Um, you can complete uh, a, an accredited um, ultrasound program, uh, which is the path that I went through. I completed a program through um, a university in Pennsylvania. It was KHAP accredited. KHAP stands for um, the Commission on Accreditation of Allied Health uh, Education Programs. Um, the 12 months of clinical ultrasound experience is not included in that because it is an accredited program. So it's implied you do do clinical experience. Um, uh, clinicals in a, in a hospital or outpatient setting. So that is part of the program. Um, or you can do cross-training uh, after completing a two-year program. So for example, um, Mary Washington has the School of Radiology. It's a, you get a two-year um, two degree in radiology or x-ray. Um, you come out of that, you would, you know, sit for, sit for your certifications, get your ART registrations, um, and then you could apply to um, a cross-training program within MIF LLC. So Medical Imaging of Fredericksburg has the cross-training ultrasound program. It's 12 months, which gets you that 12 month of clinical experience. So it kind of is the same as that first bullet where you're completing a two-year allied health program, and then you're getting your 12 months of ultrasound experience. Additional requirements. Um, so there is, a, just like x-ray, a certification or registration from a professional organization, um, like the American Registry of Radio Radiologic Technologists, sorry, it's a, spe a spelling error in there, um, or the American Registry for Diagnostic Medical Sonography, or the ARDMS. Um, many organizations, many health organiz healthcare organizations will accept applicants with ARRT sonography, which is the, the ARRT um, professional organization with the sonography credential, um, but will eventually require a registry from the ARDMS, which is the sonography specialty professional um, organization within a certain time period. Um, so I believe within Mary Washington, you can apply and begin uh, employment with ARRTS, but we do require ARDMS uh, within I think 12 months of um, starting employment. And the websites um, that I have uh, on the bottom there, the ARRT.org and ARDMS.org are um, very useful for um, information regarding both professions. Um, so like I talked about with X-ray, ultrasound has several registries as well. Um, they are um, the following, so you have uh, you could be RDMS, which is you're a registered diagnostic medical sonographer. Under that registry, there are uh, five specialties. So there's abdomen, which is considered general, obstetrics and gynecology, uh, fetal echocardiography, echocardi pediatric sonography, and breast sonography. Um, myself personally, I have the abdomen, the OBGYN, and the breast sonography. So I am uh, the alphabet soup after my name is RDMS, and then abdomen, OBGYN, and breast. Um, there's also registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer. So if you want to perform echocardiograms on patients um, that assesses the heart, there's um, different specialties depending on the age of um, the patient. So there's adult, fetal, um, and then pediatric. So fetal is uh, during the pregnancy, you would go, you know, if there's a suspected heart abnormality or family history, um, you would go for a fetal echo, and that is uh, a registered cardiac sonographer um, who specializes in fetal echo is who would be performing that. Then there's re uh, registered vascular technologist or RVT. That is its own specialty. Um, there's no uh, subspecialty categories under that. And then uh, within the last couple of years, they created a registered muscular skeletal sonographer um, or RMSKS. That also, like RVT, is um, a sole specialty. There's no uh, addi additional subcategories under that. The ARRT does offer certification in sonography, vascular sonography, and breast sonography as well if you want to go the ARRT route. So lots of options, lots of specialties. Um, the, the additional and more specialties that you acquire and that you sit for, and these are exams that you do have to sit for to get these specialties, um, the more marketable you are um, and the more experience that you can get and gain from doing this um, you know, for an employer and, and the more marketable you are. 
So job responsibilities as a sonographer, a lot of it mirrors the x-ray tech. So of course, um, provide compassionate care, verify the patient identifiers, um, correct patient, correct exam, um, detailed history prior to performing the exam. Has the patient had any surgeries? How long have their symptoms been going on for? What symptoms are they having? Um, follow a LARA. So even though there's no radiation with ultrasound, um, you still want to limit exam time to uh, what is necessary only. Um, mostly this pertains to output power of the sound waves during obstetric ultrasound. There's no, um, there's no uh, real study or um, information that shows that or proves that ultrasound is harmful um, to a fetus during an OB ultrasound. Um, there is a level of um, heat that is uh, created by the sound waves. Um, it's called, ther you know, there's a, a thermal index. So, you know, there is a theory that, you know, if you hold a, uh, if you perform an exam for longer, you run the risk of, of heating up tissue. Um, again, nothing's been proven. There's no studies, um, but because it is the right thing to do, we do follow a LARA and we limit our exam time and make sure our output power is appropriate for the exam. Um, ensure the patient is in the proper position and they're comfortable. Um, ultrasound does take a little bit longer than say an x-ray. Um, an x-ray might take five minutes to position and, and shoot, um, but an ultrasound, depending on the type of exam, could be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour that the patient is lying there on your stretcher while you're performing this exam. So you wanna make sure that they are as comfortable as possible. Um, and you wanna make sure that uh, you require, that all of the required images for your exam um, are completed and provided to the radiologist for interpretation. Um, so whereas a, an X-ray might be two images, uh, a lateral um, and an AP, ultrasound will have a series of, uh, of images that you need to acquire for the radiologist. You are essentially their eyes. Um, if you do not acquire the image that shows an abnormality, the radiologist will not see it. Um, so um, there's a lot of responsibility with making sure that, you know, you're properly trained and you have the experience and that you are able to provide all of that information for the radiologist to help in uh, diagnosing a patient. Of course, complete all paperwork and documentation. And again, you do not diagnose or interpret the images. Um, like I had stated previously, many patients will try and ask, um, I know you can't tell me, I know, yeah, I know that you're not supposed to say anything, but you know what you're looking at. Um, yeah, most of the time we do know what we're looking at. We need to understand what normal is and, and what abnormal is as well, um, but it is not our responsibility or in our job scope to diagnose um, or give those results to the patient. So you get pretty creative with your responses to patients when they, they ask you over and over again. Um, a lot of times you just say, I'm the picture taker, um, but you're really so much more than that. You do need to know all of your anatomy um, and know how to manipulate the, the equipment and the image, um, but it's the easiest uh, response to a patient who is nagging you for results. Um, work environment, so very similar to an x-ray uh, technologist hospital. So you might work, you know, you might do ER patients, uh, you might work in an operating room. Um, and then uh, portable um, as well. So the ultrasound machines on wheels, you can wheel it up to a floor if a patient is inpatient. Um, an outpatient imaging center, provider offices like OBGYN offices, and then mobile imaging. Again, expect frequent pushing, pulling, lifting, um, and to be on your feet for long periods of, day, uh, of the day. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of uses in the clinical setting for ultrasound. Um, since we don't expose the patient to any radiation, it's often the first exam that is ordered to try and establish a diagnosis. Um, if ultrasound does not answer the question, patients could be referred to CT or MRI imaging. Um, but because we are relatively cheaper and we don't have radiology, um, or I'm sorry, radiation, uh, usually um, an abdomen ultrasound may be ordered before a CT of the abdomen. Um, Usually ultrasound is associated with babies. Everybody thinks, um, you know, it's all babies all the time. Uh, you know, we do, we do do ultrasounds for babies. It's useful um, in determining many aspects of a pregnancy, such as how many, um, how many babies there are, if the baby's growing and developing normally, you wanna make sure that their anatomy is normal, um, or if there's any issues that they can get the care that they need, you know, prior to being delivered and while they're delivered. Um, and then are there any issues with the pregnancy? But babies are just a small portion of what we can image. Um, general ultrasound evaluates all the soft tissue organs of the abdominal and pelvic cavity. We look for masses, fluid collections, structural abnormalities. Um, they may be congenital, meaning you're born with it, or it may be from a disease process. 
Cardiac sonography um, assesses the heart and its function, proper blood flow if there's any structural abnormalities. MSK ultrasound um, assesses tendons, ligaments, muscles, um, may be able to establish a diagnosis without radiation and without the need for more expensive imaging. Neonatal imaging for brains, baby brains, um, hips and spines can aid in the diagnosis of any congenital hip or spinal abnormalities without providing or exposing the patient to radiation. Um, you know, infants and babies, their, their organs and their systems are developing still. So, you know, if we can provide a diagnosis without radiating the patient, that is, you know, that is key. There's vascular sonography. We look at arteries and veins for normal blood flow blockages due to plaque or blood clots that can eventually, you know, if you have a blood clot in your leg, it can travel to your lungs. So we, we are usually the first to assess for that. Um, ultrasound serves as a guide during procedures. So such as to remove fluid from the chest or abdominal cavity um, during biopsies, like uh, for structures of the liver, breast, or thyroid. Um, it could be used in an emergency or trauma setting or out in the field, um, you know, if, in a military setting to determine if there's any blood around the heart or in the abdominal cavity. It's known as FAST, um, which is an abbreviation for focused assessment with sonography. Typically, these are um, just, e you know, EMTs or, or medical professionals. They're not sonographers. They're trained on how to use the equipment at a very basic level, but to assess for fluid or blood. Um, machine, ultrasound machines are smaller than uh, many other modality equipment, so it can be portable. Um, we can go to the bedside of an ER patient or an inpatient, um, or it could be transported by vehicle to provide mobile services um, for patients who can't leave their home or care facility. Now the technology is incredible. You can just buy a transducer um, and hook it up to your phone and perform ultrasounds that way. Um, there's so many different types of um, cutting edge advanced technology now with ultrasound that you don't need a giant machine anymore. Um, you can literally just buy a transducer that plugs into your USB-C on your phone and you can do an ultrasound. Um, of course, it's not gonna be as high quality as on an ultrasound machine, but it's still amazing that you can do that. Um, and then there are limitations. Um, so ultrasound uh, cannot, sound cannot travel through gas in the intestines or stomach. So any gas in the bowel or the stomach can hinder the transmittal of sound waves and therefore it'll limit the production of an image. Um, the density of bone limits any assessment of brain abnormalities um, past the fetal age because the sound waves cannot travel through bone. We can do, um, like I had mentioned, neonatal brains and baby brains, but they have a soft spot that we image through. We don't image through the skull. So beyond the age of, of one, when that soft spot closes, um, we, can, we cannot do any brain imaging. And then of course, some ultrasound images. So we have a fetal ultrasound. This is, um, many people may be familiar with um, a fetal ultrasound or the cute profile. Um, to the right is a neonatal brain. Um, so like I was saying, that is an image through the soft spot of the baby's brain and you get the left and right um, hemispheres of the brain. You look for brain bleeds, masses, um, anything like that, uh, you know, that could be abnormal in a, in a, in a baby brain. Um, and then we've got uh, a normal liver to the left with a kidney. Um, and then I had mentioned biopsy guidance. So you have down on the bottom middle is this bright line and that is ultrasound guidance for, um, you know, watching a, a biopsy needle go into the lower part of a kidney to do a kidney biopsy. Um, they don't have to perform surgery to do a biopsy. You can just do it under ultrasound guidance and watch the needle go right to the area. They take a tissue sample and you can get a diagnosis. Um, and then to the right is um, a breast ultrasound. Um, so that does unfortunately show an abnormal mass. It's that darker area. Um, and it's darker because the sound waves um, are getting absorbed by the abnormal tissue. So there's not as many sound waves to bounce back to the transducer. Um, and that's how, you know, goes back to how the ultrasound is created, the image. Um, so I have uh, listed here some job opportunities within Mary Washington. Um, we do have uh, several PRN and uh, full-time x-ray positions at both Mary Washington Stafford Hospital and within um, Medical Imaging of Fredericksburg, or any of our outpatient sites that do x-ray. Um, they're posted as a diagnostic technologist. It's the same as an x-ray technologist. Um, we have several full-time positions for ultrasound open. Um, we have a Lee's, uh, an evening opening at Lee's Hill. Um, a daytime and evening opening at the Fredericksburg location. I have an evening um, position open up here. 
Um, and then there is a full-time overnight at Mary Washington Hospital and then a PRN sonographer at Stafford Hospital. Um, you know, ultrasound and, and x-ray and medical imaging in general, you know, it's one of those healthcare um, careers that just, it's rewarding, um, you know, taking care of patients. For me personally, I love taking care of people. I love helping people. So for me, it's a very re rewarding career. Um, and it's not going to go anywhere. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to dissipate. Unfortunately, people are going to be sick. People are going to need imaging and healthcare. Um, and the field is just going to keep advancing and, and, and growing. And, um, you know, the advancements in the technology are just going to keep getting better and better. Um, so it is a, you know, a career that is, is always going to be available. And that is the end of my um, presentation. Um, so I uh, am open to answer any questions. I don't know if anything came across in the chat or um, if anybody has any questions. Yes, there's one question in the chat. Sure. What are the main three imaging traits or the best traits that you have to consider when hiring in the radiology department? That is a very good question. Um, so just to clarify, so when we're looking at a candidate, um, what are we looking for in a candidate basically for radiology? Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, compassionate um, and caring, um, it, number one, you know, you, you, it's difficult to have somebody who's working with patients who doesn't want to be there or doesn't want to take care of the patient. So they have to be compassionate and caring. Um, for me, attention to detail, um, you know, especially with ultrasound, you have to be able to find the tiniest little abnormality in, in a normal structure. So attention to detail. Um, and then uh, let's see, the third aspect that I would look for um, so I said attention to detail and then compassionate, um, being able to communicate is, is the third one I would say, um, being able to hold a conversation with a patient or, um, communicate any issues with leadership. Um, you have to be able, uh, you have to have communication skills, um, you know, especially with ultrasound. Uh, the patient's laying on a stretcher for up to 45 minutes to an hour, and, you know, they're staring at you as you're scanning them, um, wondering what you're seeing and what you're doing. Um, and it could be awkward for, you know, both the technologist and the patient. So being able to, you know, maybe have a conversation with the patient, communicate what you're doing, what to expect for the patient um, without giving results or, or anything like that. Thank you, Joanne. And, you know, a question I have maybe off of that that they may um, benefit from knowing is, you know, in the education piece, what classes do you think, you know, are ones to really apply yourself and do well in or if you perform better in some than others that are very important for the field? You know, maybe is that anatomy or mm -hmm. something like that? Yeah, good question. Um, so any of the imaging, uh, radiology imaging fields um, is very, very heavy in um, uh, math and science. So physics, um, ultrasound, uh, basically one of, the, one of the exams that you have to take and pass before you can become a, a registered diagnostic sonographer is a physics board um, because of the speed of sound and the sound properties and the, the um, properties of the tissue that you know, the sound waves are going into. Um, so definitely um, science and math, anatomy um, is another big one. Um, and these were all courses that uh, I had taken um, for my associate's degree before I went into an ultrasound program. So you, it's your core classes or your prerequisite classes. So um, definitely math, um, anatomy and physiology um, and uh, physics for sure. Any other questions that anyone has as far as our participants are concerned? Anything else that you can think of? I don't see any mm -hmm. other questions in the chat. If you all see a question, you know, I don't seem to see anything. Um, I have one, I'm sorry. I just was trying to unmute. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, sure. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, excellent presentation. Um, I did have a question in regards to the field. I know with COVID, um, it was mandated as a um, health professional to, of course, 
um, get the vaccination. A lot of the students that I work with are um, not wanting to pursue that route in that specific reason, not mm -hmm. wanting to have a vaccine. Would this prohibit students um, I, as we stand now with pursuing training and possibly getting a job in the healthcare field? Um, so unfortunately it could, I know some, many health organizations are allowing, um, application for exemptions. Mary Washington does allow for exemptions for, um, both the flu and the COVID vaccine, um, because Mary Washington does require the flu vaccine, the seasonal flu vaccine, and as well as the COVID vaccine. Um, but there are several, um, employees, any, anywhere within Mary Washington that have applied for exemptions. So I would not say um, to rule out this career um, option if they do not want to get the COVID vaccine or a flu vaccine, um, but they do have to be aware that many uh, of the health um, organizations may require it um, or require an exemption. And Carol, I'll add to that too, from like an educational standpoint, um, just with what the colleges in the area are doing right now, the colleges are not requiring it. However, it can be challenging when it comes to clinical rotations because they have no control over the facilities, the health systems, the long-term care facilities, things like that um, on what their rules are. And so they'll have to follow those. And so with that being said, um, something that some of the students are facing is that they're not getting their clinicals done because there is already a limit, uh, I guess a limited opportunity for the options of where the students can be placed. And so if you have that um, challenge on top of it, um, they're having some trouble um, getting that. Um, and so I have a lot of students that come to me as a resource, just being um, kind of a neutral um, organization. And so that's really challenging for them. Um, you know, when they make that personal choice, if they choose not to, um, it is making it challenging because the school can't do anything about it if mm -hmm. they are um, going to do a rotation with an organization that does require them to have that vaccination. Mm -hmm. Yes, understood. Thank you. Um, I just think that is, I see that time and time again, especially with the students I serve in the rural area, um, that is a big barrier that's coming up. Right. Um, so they're looking at other options. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, we know how taxing it is on the profession already of limited. Um, so, yeah. Right. Something and I actually had that conversation business. with one of the faculty members at Germania yesterday because their numbers were down on enrollment and they kind of wondered if that was part of it. Yes, I would say yes. Yep. Yeah. But thank you. Great okay. question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Any additional questions that anyone has for Joanne? Okay. Okay, well then let me take a take a moment to um, really thank Joanne. Joanne, you know, as I said, you know, I appreciate you um, wanting to participate for you participating today and sharing that knowledge with us. You know, the more that I think I learn about imaging, the more I seem to want to learn. And I think it does open the door for another career path that maybe students, students or participants just don't hear enough about. So I appreciate all of your information. Um, I'm sure everyone does. And again, for anyone out there, if you do want more information or if you need to connect, you're welcome to connect with us. Joanne, of course, is here at Mary Washington Healthcare. So you can connect to us through um, career development. If you have additional questions, we can get those to Joanne. If you have anything else that you wanted to, to know, we can definitely make that connection for you. And students, let's see, let me put the First, let me put this in the chat. Okay, so I have the eval in the chat. As we have mentioned throughout the symposium, we love, absolutely love your feedback. So if you'll take a moment and if you can complete that at some point during the day, um, by the day's end, that would be great. And then as far as what's coming next, uh, at 10 o'clock, we'll go ahead and have a quick 15 minute break. And then right after that, we're going to have our next presentation and the topic will be EMS. So um, our speaker is Seth Craig, and uh, we had him last year. He was amazing, and I think you all would really enjoy that as well. So you guys take a break with us. We will see you back at, let's see, what time? I'll see you back at 1015.
Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you again, Joanne. You're very welcome. Thank you for this opportunity. Sure. My pleasure.